to a new episode of Dying in Grace. This is our COVID edition, and we are now taping at home. So we've taken a hiatus, as many people have during this COVID time. But with this COVID-19 and everything else happening in 2020, we felt it was really important to, to again start the message of coping with dying, dying in grace, and being comfortable uh, as we adjust to all the changes before us. So today I am delighted to uh, welcome my dear friend and guest, Jennifer Parks. Jennifer is the general manager of McDermott Crockett Mortuary, and she's also a funeral celebrant herself. And today what we thought we would look at and discuss is how you can celebrate your loved one in the time of COVID. The traditional model of what we, what we were all used to has sort of gone away, but as we have learned, people are finding amazing ways to pivot. So uh, let me welcome Jenny to our conversation. And Jenny, maybe you could just introduce yourself briefly, how long you've been a, a general manager at McDermott Crockett, and then we'll take it from there. Thank you, Arlene. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to sit and talk with you and, and um, go over things that most people don't want to talk about. So I appreciate the time. Um, my name is Jennifer Parks. I've been with the McDermott Crockett Mortuary for 15 years and um, just find that every day I learn something new. I experience uh, and get to immerse myself in other people's stories. And that's really what I love so much is being just a tiny part of this love story. Beautiful. Um, I also want to let our audience know that if you want to learn more about Jennifer's story and the work that she does, you can go to dyingingrace.com. She's episode number two and you'll learn a lot more about her own history and her story. But now we want to pick up uh, in this time of COVID. So Jenny, tell us what it was like for you in your business when the shutdown happened. I mean, how has the impact of COVID changed things for the way you all do business? Wow. I mean, it completely evolved over time. There was a lot of fear and a lot of uh, uncertainty, um, you know, the initial numbers that we were looking at based on conversations we were having with the authorities in our community, um, you know, hospitals, and um, we were looking at, based on the population, about 5,000 deaths. So everybody was on kind of heightened alert, like, what do we do now? What's going to happen? Are we going to have enough room? Is there going to be adequate storage for everyone and you know what it what it, we found in the early days was that really um we didn't know anything we were just sort of waiting for the next thing to happen um but you know as we see in retrospect we of course didn't have those numbers in our in our community and in our county um and so for that we were you know of course absolutely grateful um it's been, very, you know, an evolution. And I think that the funeral industry as a whole has really been looked to, to, to come up with something new, to how are we going to do things different? We still have the same need. We still need to meet people where they are and in the experience that they're having with their loved ones that are either dying or have passed away and they couldn't see them. Um, so it was really important for me and for our team to be able to accommodate people wherever they were, whether that was helping people at home um, to be able to say goodbye there or to uh, accommodate for space here at the mortuary. Um, and everybody gets the option to be with their loved one or spend time before whatever that final disposition is. We got a lot of guidance from the CDC and from the National Funeral Directors Association about how to really proceed safely, how to take care of our families, take care of our, our staff, 
um, our community as they came through our doors. And, um, you know, we get good advice from great professionals. Great. Right. Um, yeah. it, it's good to hear that the industry came together to, I mean, we're, the whole country, the whole world is kind of trying to yeah. figure it out. I wanted to um, go back to the very beginning. I know uh, we had an experience where a friend of ours passed away. She had a green burial in Santa Rosa, and the plan was to do a, a memorial, as a lot of people do, like, a couple right. weeks later and that had to be canceled uh because it was right in the beginning of covid so we had to kind of figure out some way to do that how how did the shutdown impact burials did you have some that were slated to occur and you couldn't do what you had planned or were you able to go through with a few of them as far as burials in ground burials whole body burials, we were able to, to still do those. Um, you know, each of our cemeteries have their own rules and what they will and will not accommodate. So we just really had to communicate that. The churches were shut down for a long time. Um, now they're opened at limited capacity. Uh, so we're still able, you know, we're now able to do things that we weren't able to do just a few months ago. But um, yeah, a lot of things, we had to get real creative um, in how do you honor someone's life and their traditions and their relationships when nobody can be together? And so we have, we got, our company really is very innovative and really stretched and found ways. We've, we've developed a, or we developed a partnership with a, a new company called TributeCast where we can live stream from anywhere. There's a cell connection or a Wi-Fi connection um, so it could be in someone's backyard or in a park, um, it could be outside here, it could be anywhere. And it's really, that's been really, really helpful. Whereas you can use things like Facebook Live or, or things like, or Zoom, but this is really tailored to be a tool for grieving families. It's a, um, it's a webcasting service that um, that we set up and it has these interactive touch points where family, like I can put a, a tribute video along with it or the obituary or pictures. There could be all kinds of things that people who are viewing this service remotely can still participate in all of those things that you would normally see at a funeral service. So that's been really, really helpful. Um, and then you know, we've just accommodated people here at the, at the chapel to come and see their loved ones. You know, if there was 20 people, then, you know, we had 10 and then they left and then 10 more came in, you know, and we cleaned the place and make sure everything was um, sterilized and as best we could. And, you know, I think you really just, you have to be as flexible as possible and find ways to say yes. So, so I'm um, trying to understand. So say my loved one dies of COVID in the hospital, then you would go to the hospital and pick up the body and then bring it to your site, prepare it. And it sounds like you made a wake, uh, yeah. an old fashioned wake. So people could go see their loved one. Absolutely. 10 people at a time. Absolutely. That must have brought people some kind of comfort, especially because so many people uh, have not been able, as you said earlier, to say goodbye to their loved ones. They were prevented from visiting right. or, you know, any of those things. So right, and you know, we've we've used universal precautions, just like the healthcare industry, for, you know, since the beginning of time. So we we really know how to protect ourselves, our staff, our community. You know, the, the National Funeral Directors Association and CDC just recommend that, you know, families don't kiss someone who has been infected with COVID just because we don't know. You know, we, we think with most things, most diseases die with the host. But, you know, with this, it's so novel and new, we just, we don't know. So we take the precautions, you know, come and say goodbye to the, this, this body that animated someone's life. This is what we love, the, 
arms that wrap around us and the lips that, you know, kiss our forehead. And, you know, if it's your mama, then you want to see her and say goodbye. And I just had to find a way that we were able to work around, you know, keeping people safe. And so I think we do a really good job of that. And because that's, of course, paramount. I, I don't want anybody to have been here and, and you know, gotten infected with, with uh, COVID. And so, you know, we t we're very careful and everyone wears masks and we, um, you know, but we encourage it. We say, you know, if you need to come, come. It's important. So when you created a funeral, uh, how did people, did, did you piece it together with this thing? So for instance, if somebody was going to sing a song, were they in your chapel or did, could they sort yeah. of zoom it in and sing some from somewhere else? So um, we did, um, the service that I did here, we did outside. So we, I had everybody bring, and they were a very sort of relaxed and casual family, and they, everybody brought blankets to sit on the grass, where they brought their own chairs um, so that they were comfortable, and we, we spaced them out, you know, in their family groups, and so they were able to, you know, have the person who sang here, um, and I was able to just pan the camera over to, to them, um, but what the participants there were there was like 156 people watching um in in three countries so um and states back east and new zealand and 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 canada and so the ex the people who would have normally come you know that weren't able to were still able to be here which i thought was just amazing but then i was able to um create a tribute video for him, which everybody would have seen if they were sitting in the chapel, right? In this case, they're sitting in front of their computer and they can press a button and the tribute video plays. And the, the photo book that I had put together, um, they click that button and they have access to all those photos so they could download them, they can save them, they can have them enlarged, they can keep them in their library, you know, like they would say, oh, I, I've never seen that picture of him. You know, oh, what a great picture of him and his kids or whatever it might have been. And that takes the burden off the family too, to not have to, oh, will you send me that? You know, could you send me that? And this way, it's all right there in front of them. So I'm in a foreign country. I'm watching this memorial for my loved one. And then I get an electronic link to the recording. So I have it. Forever, it's live. I could share yeah. with everybody. Yeah. So, firstly, it's live. You get a private, you get an invitation like a Zoom link that's, uh, you know, private. So, it's not on Facebook Live or, you know, out there in the world if you don't want the whole world to participate. Um, you click on that link and it gives you a key. You, you're in the live, you're there virtually. And then after the service, they push it out to video, which makes it available for. Um, I think 90 days where you can go back to it and download it to your computer. Wow. Cool. It's really neat. It, it sounds it wonderful. Sounds and I'm wondering what additional training or, or what new skills did your team have to develop? Because that is not the way you've done it. So no. <laughs> what was the learning curve for you all? Well, luckily they provided some pretty good training and they, uh, you know, sent the, all the equipment that we needed. Um, so it made it pretty easy, but you do have to put on your creativity hat. You know, this isn't just your everyday, this, I mean, we don't, I try not to do things like that anyways, because I feel like this is their love story and we want to share their life. You know, it isn't just the, the rituals and, and, you know, it may be the, very common rituals that everybody's used to, but how do you sprinkle in there this and illustrate how this person lived and who they were and what they meant to the people who they loved, you know? And so um, there's always an element of creativity, but you really had, we, I mean, I think all of us, even in everyday life have to get a little bit more creative. How do we stay connected with our friends? 
How do we not go stir crazy just staying at home? You know, how do we keep the kids from, you know, losing their minds if they can't go play football or whatever it is they do? And how do we keep them on track at school? So I think everybody has had to like think outside the box. And in some instances, I don't think that's a bad thing. You know, I think it's okay for us to stretch our ourselves a little bit and say, how can we take care of each other? Because really that's paramount in this and do it in a way that we can keep everybody safe. It seems to me there might be more things that the family needs to do to help make it happen. And yeah. at the same time, that can really help them with the grieving process, like going oh, yeah. through the pictures and, um, and maybe in a way getting, I don't want to say excited, but, but feeling some contentment in the creative process and making yeah. it a familiar or all of them together planning Working. in a way that might yeah. not have happened if it was in a traditional setup. Exactly. We've done a lot more home visitations too, which I've always loved. But, you know, people think, you know, we ask them, do you have room in your house? Or do you have room at your auntie's house or some, your best friend's house? And, and we'll bring, we'll bring the deceased there, you know, then they can be with them all night. They could be with them, you know, for a day or two if they wanted and be able to have that community and not have the restrictions of 10 people in a room. You know, if they do it outside, if they have a big backyard or a patio or something like that, then, you know, we just bring the whole thing there. And that's been, you know, it's very um, common in, you know, in Mexico to, to stay the night at the funeral home. That's something that's just something that's done. Right. And so in this case, we just bring them home. I know that in your services, you really work with whatever the desires are of the family. But I think for a lot of people listening, the idea of home visitation, while they're, it's coming back and home funerals are getting a resurgence and mm -hmm. wakes at home, which is what right. used to happen all the time, are starting to also people are starting to be a little more comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. But um, one is what kind of, maybe you could explain to our, our listeners, when you do a home visitation, what, besides having an adequate space, how do you prep the, I mean, what do they need to know about how that happens? I would say the majority are electing for embalming, okay. um, which of course is the preservation of the body, you know, we, I always say un, unembalmed bodies are unpredictable, you know, which is fine, but um, most people don't, aren't comfortable with that. And so I'd say nine times out of 10, they would, they are electing embalming. And then it's just the usual preparation that we do, you know, dressing them and preparing them, making sure that, you know, their hair looks good and mom has her shade of lipstick on. And, and then we bring the casket, the, the church truck, which, holds the casket. Um, we bring candles. We bring a crucifix if that's part of their faith. And, you know, and we'll bring the flowers, everything that they have asked for or um, wanted or needed. We bring, you know, easels for pictures and the book and, um, you know, whatever it is that we might have arranged for. And we set a specific time. So we'll be there at this particular time you can invite your friends, your family. And, you know, oftentimes what happens is they, you know, people come and go, and then there are some that stay the night. And then typically the service is the next day. So we will come early in the morning and make the transfer from the house to the church or the, the cemetery, wherever we're going. Um, but none of that is left to the family to do. So that we take care of all of that, but it's the usual preparation. I mean, even if somebody wanted to be, wanted their loved one at home and they didn't want them embalmed, there are some things, you know, with gel packs and dry ice that we can, we can do to mitigate that process a little bit. We probably right. wouldn't have them do it as long. Got it. So maybe a little bit later in, in the evening pick, and then going back pretty early in the morning. Are people allowed 
what what is the current status? Are are there can you have ten people at the graveside? I, I know at one point people had to park outside funeral homes and just watch. Or so, what's the current? Mm -hmm. Where are things currently here in our community? Right now, um, Santa Barbara Cemetery has restrictions in that we bring the deceased, they place the casket on the lowering device, the family is 20 feet away, um, they lower the casket and the grounds crew immediately come in and fill the hole and, and finalize that process. The family can't really um, have a service until that whole process is done once the cemetery staff has moved away, they can, they can gather. They're still recommending 10 people, um, but they're, uh, so that's their rules. Um, some of the other cemeteries are allowing for the service to occur. The grounds crewmen and no, none of the cemetery staff are nearby, but we're there. And then as soon as it concludes, everybody leaves and they do the burial. Um, Calvary, I think, you know, you can have about 25 people. Carpinteria Cemetery, you can have about 25 people and there aren't as many restrictions there. Um, Goleta Cemetery, I think, is about the same. As long as everybody is adhering to social distancing and wearing masks, they are pretty, they're allowing for whatever people need. But uh, Santa Barbara Cemetery does have some pretty strict rules that they need, that we have to abide by. Yeah. I'm wondering, um, what you're noticing in terms of if you notice a change or not in the way people are dealing with things? There's definitely a huge um, relief when they can, you know, if they want to see their loved one when they can. I had a family a, a few months ago that were like, thank, you know, thank you so much. Nobody else would let us. And, and you know, for me, it was, you know, well, how can we do this and do it right? And so um, there's been a lot of, you know, a lot of gratitude. People understand that our hands are tied. You know, it's just like wanting to go sit inside a restaurant. You can't, you know, and you just can't. There's, the restaurant's not going to let you. And so there are some things that, you know, we, we have to say, no, we can't have 50 people in this room. And as you can see, there are no chairs. We have no chairs out. Um, we usually only set out whatever we're gonna, we're anticipating. Um, and so people understand, but there's also, like I said, the creativity, you know, even with the use of technology is fantastic. We can stay connected. We can do the things that we'd like to do, maybe not in the largest of numbers, but, and there's no, there's nothing that says that you can't have a do-over either. You know, that memorial service that you really want to have, maybe we do that at mom's birthday and or, you know, the anniversary of her passing or, you know, on some other special occasion or maybe the day that this world opens back up again. Um, but, you know, people are resilient and innately kind, I think. And they understand when somebody dies, it's it's not business as usual, you know, especially not in their family units. Right. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, are, do you think with the change of things that children are more involved in the process than they've been in the past because it's so public? And I, I mean, do you see people involving children in different ways than maybe in a traditional setting or it's no different? Recently, I have experienced that the kids are more involved. Um, I think there's just so much stress, yeah. so much stress for them that they, you know, between school and missing their friends and missing their people, um, you know, the activities that they do all the time. And then when somebody dies, you know, it's like one more big stress. So I've recently had some really amazing kids, like a 10 year old, and then tomorrow, I, um, I'm, we're having a rosary for a young man and his six-year-old niece said, I wanna see him. And she was, she was certain. And so, you know, I think that intangible, like they just, they were here one day, gone the next, is hard for them. And so I, 
I encourage people to involve the kids, you know, whether it be just writing a note or a letter or drawing a picture to put in with them and slip in their pockets, you know, or, you know, whatever it might, whatever brings them comfort. But I think when you don't involve kids, um, it just leaves this big, uncertain, scary thing that you don't, they don't know what to do with. But recently I've seen more kids involved. Well, well, in an odd way, I think the fact that, that the pandemic has made death so pervasive, I mean, yeah. it's just, there's no escape. Um, I'm hoping that it will shift some of our attitudes about death. It's not that it's anything anybody wants to have happen to somebody they love or to themselves, right. but at the same time, um, involving children can really change the focus so that they're not as afraid. I know I'm working with a family and the grandfather's dying. And we talked a lot about encouraging the kids are three different ages from like eight to 14. And each one of them has a different understanding, mm -hmm. but it's really important that um, they're involved in the, in the awareness of, of, of grandpa's dying and then looking at how they could participate in celebrating grandpa when Absolutely. he finally leaves. So, um, you know, hopefully some of that will change the culture. I think we are changing slowly anyway. And, yeah. and I, I'm wondering if with the pandemic, if you've seen more people come to you to like pre-plan and make arrangements than maybe in the past, has it in a weird yeah. way spiked your business? Um, I, I haven't seen a huge spike, but people are definitely calling to inquire, how does it work? What do I do? Um, what should I think about? What, what do I need to have in place? You know, talking about the advanced healthcare directive and, you know, really uh, getting that information out has been great. Um, I was talking to one of the cemetery, the cemetery manager in Carpinteria, and he said, he had never sold so many plots in one month in his 14 or 15 year career there. And then I think it was August, July or August. They, he just, it was like, you know, he said, I've never sold so many plots in my life. And I think people are just, there's so much fear, you know, it, especially in the beginning, there was so much fear because there was so much, uh, you know, whether it was the right information or the wrong information, there just wasn't enough of the right information. And so people just, you, when you, they panic, you know? Yeah. But, you know, there's that pervasive thought, like what happens if I get sick? You know, yeah. my kids were super careful for me. With, uh, and so, and still, and continue to be because, you know, the thought is with the information that's out there, if, if I get sick, I'll go to the hospital. So, you know, so it's, I think it, it is increasing the awareness and maybe I should get my, my plans in place just in case. Yeah, that, that is that, I mean, if, if that's the takeaway for people to understand, and I think at the beginning, we all thought it was, well, you're just kind of the people that are 80 and over or compromised right. health. And as t times marched on, we, so many people are vulnerable. We don't have all the statistics. And so right. um, if people are, are taking stock of the beauty of their life and looking to how to be kind and how to be together in all right. of this, um, like you said, there's extraordinary creativity and willingness among people. Yeah. Uh, one last question, and, uh, or maybe two. Um, what would you say is the biggest lesson that you and maybe your staff have learned in dealing in a pandemic? I would say um, to keep, we absolutely have to keep learning and reading and staying up on what the newest, latest information is that's out there um, and separate the misinformation from the truth and go to reliable sources, you know, NFDA and CDC are, you know, sort of the gold standard. And, and if they say do this, then that's what we do. Because at least that's the framework, you know, it's the path that we can start with. And then using universal precautions always, which we've always done anyhow. 
Um, I think we have to take to slow down a little bit and be, you know, I've always said, and I know you've heard me say this, but our first job is to listen. We really have to listen and understand where people are coming from and really read between the lines and the nuances of what they're saying, because they might say one thing and really want something else and, but don't think that they can do it or don't think that they can have it or whatever, for whatever that reason. So really being deliberate in taking time and being, and it, it's hard to do when you're in a pandemic and in places like New York and all of those places where there was no time for any of that, you know, um, and I can't even imagine my heart goes out to those people, those last responders who show up every day. Uh, it's an enormous, enormous task. I can't even thank them enough, but um, luckily we haven't had that that same experience. And so we can take, take a minute and make sure that people are really um, communicating what their needs are. And if they aren't or they can't, then sort of finessing that out. Yeah. Uh, and to be patient and kind with each other. My staff, there were several members of my staff were very, very, very concerned. And, and you know, some that were more cavalier, like, oh, it's going to be okay. And some that were really, really not okay with that. And so taking the time and being patient with them and each other and just showing that kindness to each other as well is important, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think what's true is we're, none of us on the planet have been in this situation. So I think we're all attempting to do the best we can and cope however we cope. And some people right. cope with kindness and some people find other methods that may not be as, um, contributing to the larger scheme right. of things, but we have to make room for them too, because it's out of their pain and their fear uh, that Absolutely. some of this stuff happens. So uh, what would be your final message for our viewers about memorializing someone they love? God forbid somebody dies in the next couple months and we're still in isolation. What's the message and comforting message you want to offer people about what's possible for their loved one? I would say talk to each other. This is a perfect opportunity to, uh, you know, even if the, you know you're not gonna get sick or, you know, it's, it, your risk is very low, talk to each other. You know, have that conversation over wine, have a Zoom party, you know, a death dinner or whatever you decide to have. But, you know, even if it's just in casual conversation, hey, if I, something were to happen to me, what should I, you know, this is what I want. My sister always told me that she wanted to be scattered on a little league field and she wanted to be a diamond. And so I have that information tucked away. I know she wants to be cremated. I'll be able to do those things, you know. But for some, you've never had the conversation. So you don't know what it is that they want. So how that's number one, have the conversation, just make it casual, make it, make it um, scheduled, put it all down on paper or don't, but just tell someone what it is that you want. And then I would say, ask, ask the questions you want. Think about the things that are important and chances are the answer is yes, or we'll figure out a way to make it yes. We've, you know, we're, we're very resourceful and we can find a way to make it happen if it's important. So um, I would say, don't be fearful and, you know, ask your local funeral professional, you know, have coffee with them over Zoom or whatever. Any, everything you wanted to know about death, but we're afraid to ask. Right, uh, and, I, and I also think that um, don't wait. Wait. You get sick. Don't wait till somebody's in a crisis mode or in the hospital or in the ICU. I mean, right. um, so again, I think having the conversation and the curiosity and uh, I mean, part of what you're explaining is the, po the there's limitless possibilities to celebrate a right. loved one. And going back to the earlier example you gave, it might very well be that if the person had a real funeral, the regular one in Santa Barbara, 
the family member in New Zealand would not make that check. But nope. techno technologically, they can do it. So yeah. there are and, blessings there. And we can stay connected, you know, Google Hangout, Zoom, all those things, you know, we have people do happy hours or, you know, on Friday nights or whatever that might be, slip it into the conversation. Hey, you know, I, I mean, people expect it of me because, <laughs> you know, I always have those conversations, but, you know, if, if you have a, your family that you meet with every week, you know, via Zoom or Google Hangout and you just say, hey, you guys, I'd like to talk about maybe what everybody wants in the event, you know, that we don't get out of here alive. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, and I just want to uh, plug one thing, and I don't know if you've heard of it, uh, Jenny, but I have two of them, and they're called Death Decks, and they're actually playing oh, yeah. cards, and it's a game, and there's several of them, so that it, it can be funny. It, it can, yeah. it, can um, it, opens, it opens the conversation, however you Absolutely. do it. So You can totally do it funny and, and fun, you know, like you could have a theme party, you know, dinner with death and, you know, have everybody cook their favorite meal and, yeah. and, yeah. you know, do it that way. Or, you know, there's a thousand ways to do it, but really just have to be bold and be unafraid and just understand that this is love. Yeah. What you, yeah. by talking about it, it's like wrapping your arms around somebody and making sure they're okay. Yeah. Well, that, we'll leave it there because being kind and understanding that, that dealing with your final days is love for all concerned is a beautiful yeah. message. So Jenny Parks, I want to thank you again for being my debut COVID guest. And anytime you offer such a wonderful service in this community and to the larger community at large. So thank you again. Thank you. And for our visitors, um, if this is your first time coming to Dying in Grace, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and we will be posting new episodes on a regular basis, so stay tuned.